Hello, my name is Caleb Bannistrup, and I am a senior technical sales engineer on the Plus One Autonomy team. Today, I'm going to be walking you through an example application that uses our autonomous control library blocks in the Plus One Guide environment. The goal is to be able to give you a basic understanding of how you can structure an autonomous system, as well as show you how the Plus One autonomous control library blocks may fit into your system. So let's get started. This example is of a self-propelled feed mixer that the primary purpose is to mix feed ingredients and deliver a predetermined feed ration to cattle. We can break the application into four main steps. The first step is loading at the batch box. This is where all the feed is dumped into the mixer um, and the mixer mixes the feed. The next step is then navigating to the correct pen or cattle yard where the feed must be unloaded. The third step is then unloading. This is where the mixer will drive along a feed bunk and drop the feed into the feed bunk at a consistent rate. And then finally, returning back to the loading station to get the new and next load. I then took these four main states or steps and broke them up into smaller tasks that are easier to deploy and automate. And I'm going to show you this and guide next how I set these up. But before we do that, I'm going to point you to the plus one update center where you can find this example application. I'd recommend following along if you can. And if you do, please go ahead and pause this video and get that downloaded before we get started. Next, I'm going to move to the guide application where I've added a block for a state machine. This is where we can set up each of the tasks that I mentioned and control the flow from one task to another. First, we will need to define the states that we intend to create. I've done this in the state defined block. Each state has been assigned its own unique number that will be used later when calling that state. The first step of the state machine block is the initialization state. This is where a user input or command will be read to start or initiate autonomous operation. In the initiate state, we need to define what state we want to send the state machine to first. In this case, we will start with loading the mixer. Let's go to the load mixer state page and see the commands on this page. In this example, the only task associated with the first state is to zero the scale. After that task has been completed, the start mixer state will be requested. So let's take a look at the start mixer state. In this state, we can stop the zero scale request after the scale has been zeroed and then request that the mixer is turned on. After the mixer is running, we can proceed to the dump hopper state. We will go into the dump hopper state, a command is sent to dump the hopper. And once the hopper dump has been completed, we can proceed to the retract hopper state. The dump hopper command is now stopped and the retract hopper command is started. Once the hopper has started to retract, we can move on and call the navigation state. Hopefully you're starting to get a feel for how the state machine is working. These states can be small or large, depending on how you want to set them up. For the sake of time, I'm going to move on to talking about our perception system. However, if you want to dig into the rest of these states, feel free to pause this video and explore more on your own. Next, we are going to look at the perception sensors and blocks. For this example, we plan on using a single LiDAR sensor to perceive the environment around us. In this case, I've dropped in the ouster LiDAR driver, which is reading all of the data directly from the sensor and is being stored in a data locker. We use data lockers as a pointer to where the data can be found by the blocks that need to consume this data. This is more efficient than passing all the data through the guide interface. Now we will take a brief look at some of the perception blocks that are consuming the LiDAR data and show you how they are connected. The first block is the reflector detection block. Reflector detection is connected to the locker ID coming from the ouster driver. 
The reflector detection block is looking for all of the reflectors that are within the line of sight and within visible range of the LiDAR sensor. And then they output the X, Y, and Z locations of each reflector out of the block. In this case, we have installed reflectors on the batch box to ensure the feed mixer is precisely aligned with the batch box before dumping. A similar approach could also be used with the post detection block that is found in the autonomous control library. There are also several other blocks that are reading data directly from the LiDAR. Obstacle avoidance, obstacle detection, projected path, and wall detection. Later, you'll see how these perception blocks can be utilized for positioning, navigation, and propulsion. Now I will focus on positioning. Understanding our position is essential for autonomy. There are a few ways for a machine to understand its global position, with the most common being through the GNSS, or otherwise known as GPS. After reviewing GNSS positioning, I'll then also brief you on another form of positioning using data from the perception sensors. In the autonomous control library, you will find several blocks that are used just for finding a machine's global position with GNSS, and these blocks are shown on my screen. Since my colleague Ryan has already made a video showing in detail how these blocks work, I'm not gonna spend too much time on it today. But if you're interested in learning more, I've added a link below so you can watch the video and learn more detail about these blocks. One thing I will point out though, is that we have added a yaw estimate block to the second version of our autonomous control library. This can be used to determine the machine's heading when this information is not readily available from the GNSS. It calculates the yaw based on the dif difference between the current position of the machine and a previous position based on a minimum distance traveled. Another way to understand the global position of the machine is to rely on the information from the perception sensors and compare this to a map of the surrounding environment. This may be important when you cannot rely on the GNSS positioning, when there is not a clear view of the sky, or you may be operating indoors. We have released a block in the second version of the autonomous control library that helps with exactly that. In this example, the feature localization block is comparing the detected reflector positions with a map of known reflector positions. Using this information, it is possible to understand the exact position of the machine and report out the XY position, which is ultimately also what we will get from the GNSS. As I mentioned before, we have installed reflectors on the batch box to ensure the feed mixer is precisely aligned with the batch box before dumping. Another requirement for the feature localization block is that it has the previous position estimate fed into the block so it can determine its precise location in case there is more than one possible correct position based on the map. For this example, this could occur when navigating in a building with uniform distances between features. I've also added some logic to this page to determine when to use the feature localization block instead of the GNSS base position. I'm not going to walk through the details of this logic but it's here as an example to show you how this could be done in your application. We have now reviewed two different approaches to finding a machine's global position. It is then useful to take these signals and run them through a position filter, which is another block that has been released in the autonomous control library. The position filter works by comparing the GNSS position with the machine yaw and wheel odometry information. The wheel odometry includes a speed and steering angle of the vehicle and can be converted into a useful yaw rate value. There is a block in the Danfoss Autonomous Control Library called Ackerman Yaw Rate that converts the wheel speed and angles to yaw rate. By combining these various positioning sensors, the position error of the machine may be reduced and the machine's position can be updated at a much faster rate than the GNSS is updating. Knowing the global position of the machine is useful in most circumstances. There are other circumstances though, where it can be more useful to understand the machine's local position with respect to another object. 
This can be more useful as the other object may not be fixed to a specific location on the Earth or the position to the object must be understood with greater accuracy than the GNSS position accuracy. In our example, it may be more useful to use local positioning when unloading into the feed bunk. In this case, it is important that the feed mixer maintain a fixed distance from the feed bunk while unloading to ensure all of the feed is properly dispensed into the bunk and not onto the ground. So how do we do this? We can utilize the LiDAR that is on the machine as well as the wall detection block from the autonomous control library to find the polar coordinates of the feed bunk with respect to the feed mixer. The polar coordinates of this line are just a perpendicular distance to the line or a distance error and then the angle error. Using these polar coordinates to the line, we can write a line follower block to navigate the feed mixer along the feed bunk. In this case, we can switch in the curvature command from the line follower block when the state machine has determined that it has reached the appropriate position to follow the feed bunk instead of navigating based on global coordinates. We have now covered many of the positioning scenarios for the feed mixer application. But how do we navigate to a destination? We can use the path follower block from the autonomous control library to help with this. There are two prerequisites required for navigation using the path follower. The first is having an understanding of the machine's position, which we have just covered in detail. The second is having a detailed step-by-step -step plan of how we want to get to where we are going. And we refer to this as path planning. In our example, the feed mixer should operate in a relatively structured environment, which can make path planning easier. In this case, we can save fixed paths from the batch box to each individual pen and vice versa in the code. And we can load whichever path we desire. I have added those fixed paths in here. The correct path is then selected within the state machine, depending on the cattle pen that was selected at the start. After we've loaded in the correct path, the path follower will then provide steering commands to keep the machine on the desired path. Or if it is not on the desired path, the path follower will then provide steering commands to get the machine back on the path. So far, we have figured out how to interpret the machine's position and navigate based on a planned path. But what about obstacles? We will discuss two ways to handle these obstacles. The first will be how to navigate around obstacles using the obstacle avoidance block from the autonomous control library. Then we will discuss how the obstacle detection block can be used to limit propel speeds. First, I'm going to show an example of how the obstacle avoidance block works. The obstacle avoidance block is simply looking at a fan of 15 zones in front of the machine to determine if any obstacles are occupying those zones. In our case, we can set a target zone, which will be straightforward. If there is an obstacle in the target zone, the obstacle avoidance block looks for the closest clear zone to the target angle to navigate through. So let's dig into an example. In this case, I have a fixed path shown in black on the screen. The boxes in gray represent cattle yards and the orange triangle represents an obstacle. So far, the target angle or target zone is green in front of the machine. So the machine is free to continue along its path. As it progresses, the target zone will no longer be free to travel through and the machine must steer left in order to avoid the obstacle. As soon as the front of the machine has cleared the obstacle, you can see that the zones have all cleared and the machine is free to turn back towards its planned path. In this case, it turns back into the target path too early and sideswipes the obstacle. Because of this, we must prevent the machine from turning back too early. I'll show a second example. In this case, the machine starts in the same way as it did during the first example, except now, this time, as, it, as the front of the machine clears the obstacle, we will force the machine to drive past the obstacle until the rear axle has cleared the obstacle. You can see in this case, the machine avoids sideswiping the obstacle and it gets back on the desired path without incident. I've added some logic in the drive-by obstacle block that will perform like the second example. Now that we have seen an example of how we can utilize the obstacle avoidance block, we will also look at using the obstacle detection block to limit the propel speeds and steering angles. 
The obstacle detection block is consuming LiDAR data to determine if there are obstacles in predefined zones around the machine. It reports the number of points or returns that it sees within each zone. A threshold of the number of points in each zone can be used to determine if an obstacle occupies a zone. Up to 100 cuboid zones can be defined at one time with the obstacle detection block if desired. In this example, I have set up 17 zones in front of and beside the machine. If obstacles are detected within these zones, I am limiting the speed based on the zone or even limiting whether the machine is free to turn in that direction. This is just one example of how these zones can be set up around the machine. The size and locations of these zones can also be changed dynamically based on other variables such as machine speed. I've configured the inputs for the obstacle detection block here, which include the zone size and location. I've then added another block behind the obstacle detection block to set the speed and steering limits for each zone that can be later used in the propel and steering portions of the algorithm. We've also added another similar block to the autonomous control library called projected path. It works in a similar way to the obstacle detection block. In this case, a path is projected in front of or behind the machine, depending on the current radius of curvature of the steered wheels. This can be useful for looking for obstacles along the current trajectory of the machine. With these blocks, I have found the speed limit of the machine. The speed limit is then consumed by the propel function as I've shown here. This concludes my video on the autonomous feed mixer example. For more information on Plus One software, please remember to visit our forum or help desk, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to see our latest video releases. Thank you for listening.